So I was asked to say something about the, uh, the history of the Plate Boundary Observatory. And uh, I think this could be, I'm going to, so technology, vision, and funds. I will explain what these amount to as I go on. I want to thank many people who sent me historical information, admit that this is like any other history, an incomplete view, and hope that people who have objections to what I'm saying and feel that I've uh, missed something will come and tell me about it. But um, perhaps not tell me that they invented PBO, because I think a lot of people did. So this is my summary. This is the history showing the growth on a log scale of the number of continuous GPS stations, of borehole strain meters, and of laser strain meters, the three components of PBO. Um, and you can see here we are at something like 1,200 uh, GPS, uh, 100 borehole strain meters. But I want to talk about the period up to the year 2000, because by the end of 1999, the idea was pretty well set. By the end of 2000, there had been a planning workshop. And um, it was, as the British say, all over bar the shouting, um, as Anne's talk indicated, that the, the subsequent few years involved a lot of shouting as the people, as, it, as the governance structure was worked out and the funding was come up with. But I want to talk about what happened before that. This is another plot on a log scale, but it doesn't quite do justice to what happened. Um, you can see that as late as 1993, there were more borehole strain meters than continuous GPS sites in uh, the western US, which seems a little odd. And there was, that's, the th that's it on a linear scale, which probably gives you a fair judgment of the amount of work involved. And here, of course, the only thing you can see is the continuous GPS which took off, where is the arrow, there, nope, which took off dramatically in about 1995, and then this is the sign network in Southern California, very steep increase. How did this, how did this happen? Well, basically because of what other people did outside the scientific community. First of all, the Defense Department spent a lot of money building the GPS system. So I was happy to find finally a number for this, $21 billion between 1974 and 1997, including launch costs. Uh, the way to think about launch costs is that you put the satellite in a pan in an equal arm balance, and you fill the other pan with gold. That pays for the satellite. Then you do it again. That pays for the launch. If you're in the commercial sector, you do it a third time to pay for the insurance. Uh, my brother was in the communication satellite business. So um, there was also a very substantial commercial investment in GPS receiver R&D by the uh, receiver manufacturers. I don't know how much, but if I had to guess, it would be in the hundreds of millions. And then least in dollars, but very important to us, development of high precision processing tools. And so here's the DOD part. Uh, this is number of satellites in the constellation from the beginning through, um, through now. No, not through now, through about 2003. And uh, there was an initial stage. There was then a pause caused by the fact that they were planning to launch them on the space shuttle, and the first space shuttle accident postponed that. And then you can see from 1989 through about 1994, they were sending up satellites at an incredibly high rate. Um, this is now the other end of the system, down, at, uh, down on the Earth. And this is, uh, this is where I have to thank a lot of people for sending me numbers. This is the price of a GPS, of a geodetic grade GPS receiver as a function of time. And you'll notice that I need a log scale to describe it. Um, for the fir through about 1995, it's plummeting, okay? It goes from about, uh, this is in current dollars, by the way. It goes from about half a million dollars when UNAVCO was started, that was how much a GPS receiver cost. And gets to 2000 and then flattens out, which is sort of like what happens with other electronic devices. You get the price eventually bottoms out, but the quality keeps going up, which is still happening. But nevertheless, there was an incredibly rapid fall in the what it cost to 
have a, con a continuous GPS site. And I think this shows up in the way two earthquakes were responded to in 1989. Loma Prieta happened. Additional funds became available for things. I don't remember anybody moving to say, let's do continuous GPS. Four and a half years later, the Northridge earthquake happened, and the immediate response was to say, let's, gee, we've put in 11 stations in Southern California. Um, let's build a much bigger network. So what's the difference in four and a half years? Well, this is the trip down memory lane part. Um, what did it take to do continuous GPS in 1989? Well, you needed a monument with an antenna on it. Uh, this happens to be the first ever drilled braced monument. Uh, the antenna may look unfamiliar except to a few people. That's because it would be connected to uh, this receiver, which was 250,000. This is the half, in current dollars, half a million dollars. Weighed 40 pounds, needed 100 watts of power. There was a, there was a sticker on the side, don't put your hand here, it's hot. Um, very useful for warming your hands in the middle of the night. I can test to that. Um, but this didn't have any memory, it recorded on cassette tape. So you also needed this uh, cutting edge device. Uh, this was about $2,000. Look, it has, it has two five inch floppy drives. You know, you're, you're paying good money for, your, for something important. Um, and then you had to connect, you know, you wanted to download the data. So you connected it to one of these, <coughs> which you could transmit back to data. And I made a mistake here. I labeled it in, in the actual units of uh, 10,000 bits per second. I think it would make more sense for a current audience to point out that this is one gigabyte per week. <clears throat> and you needed to spend $500 in phone bills. So this was a lot of work. And a few years later, the world was very different. So there's a big, a, a big uh, technology advance that is a big part of what happened and is largely driven by forces outside of the ge geodetic community. So by 1995, you could think bigger. Uh, the technology was there that made this, I mean, you could have done it in 1989, but it would have, you would have needed to be the Defense Department. Um, and so then what was required was for somebody to have the vision to have a PBO. And this is where I can only say it is, well, you may think it's extremely unfortunate that I'm giving this talk for different reasons than the one I'm about to give. Um, I will say it's extremely unfortunate because this talk really should have been given by Paul Silver. And because this is the person who, uh, in my view, if, if one person is to be pointed at, I would point at Paul because he had the idea and propagandized for a plate boundary observatory. He made it a cause. It's an interesting cause. It wasn't his research area, which was shear wave splitting. Uh, here he is staring at part of the plate boundary. Um, and so he put forward, uh, again, lots of people were thinking about continuous GPS. Paul was the person who suggested that we should have, so in seismological research letters in 98, a, a plate boundary deformation network, even had an abbreviation, ought to be capable of monitoring deformation along the Pacific North American plate boundary zone, and this is the change, of course, to the current network, dominated by the San Andreas Fault. Uh, fortunately, we've broadened beyond that. And then in a proposal from about the same time, it said, we seek to deploy a network with roughly uniform sensitivity to strain over a broad temporal spectrum, a fully integrated network of these two types of instrumentation, referring to GPS and borehole strain meters, this proposal also included this diagram, which extends from seismic frequencies on the left. It's labeled STS-1 for, you know, the preferred sensor there is a broadband seismometer. The preferred sensor on the right at long periods, but depending on, the amplitude depends on period is GPS. And then there's this hole in the middle called here the gap, not adequately covered by GPS if there are small short-term strain events, you need some kind of a strain meter, in this case, a borehole strain meter. And so this is, again, from his 1998 proposal. It's a full spectrum approach, uh, every possible deformation sensor and where it fits in. And that is 
what he viewed as you know, th what made sense for a plate boundary observatory. Uh, of course, having the vision is one thing, having it happen is another, and this gets to the third element, which is funding. Uh, and fortunately, as Anne has described, the NSF was interested. There was a model available in the form of the major research equipment and facilities construction budget. Uh, what's interesting is that this budget was generally not used for things like EarthScope. Um, it was invented, NREFC only started as an NSF program in 1995, but there were funds, things funded earlier than that. And this is each, the left hand edge of each title here is the fiscal year when it started. Uh, don't assume that it went on for as long or as short as the title is. The colors, are, so this, if everybody could, <coughs> you know, every, anybody would get a prize if they could act, recognize, except for NSF people, if they could recognize all the acronyms. Uh, I don't know whether these count for the acronym Poetry Slam later. Um, so the things in red are what I call compact sensors. Compact in this case means you could, in principle, stand on a 10-story building and see them all. Some of them are spread out over a mile or so. Uh, Gem most of them are telescopes. Gemini, LIGO, uh, LIGO-2, ALMA, IceCube, ATST, all those things with the exception of Hyper, which is an aircraft, and LHC, which is the Large Hadron Collider. There are a bunch of things in blue which have the common element of being in high latitudes. Those are basically infrastructure polar program things. There are a couple of network, uh, Terascale Computing, and NICE, the Earthquake Engineering Organization. But relatively, uh, I believe it took a fair amount of work within NSF for people within GEO to make the argument that it made sense for NSF to fund distributed sensors, distributed over a large area. This looked like, to them, like funding a network. Uh, NSF has always been a little averse to funding ongoing geophysical networks. Um, but the argument was made successfully, and I think it helped that EarthScope had a strong science vision and well-developed technology. Another factor in many of these things is if you look up their history, so ALMA, for example, uh, was funded in 1999, but if you look at its history, it started in 1981. So uh, many of these had to develop their own technology before they could be ready. EarthScope was effectively on the technology side already there. So it was funded by uh, 2003 and there's the timeline. Uh, Paul Silver described it at an IRIS meeting in 95. Uh, an initial letter was sent to NSF in 1998. Um, there was a larger meeting. There were a number of letters and thoughts that went back and forth, but there was in a fairly important meeting at NSF in early 1999. NSF bought into this concept, funded one workshop in October 99, a second workshop in October 2000, and as I say, the, the planning part of planning and siting part of PBO was basically over at that, soon after that second workshop. And in January 2003, the PBO proposal was sent to NSF. Uh, that's a uh, convenient, gives me a convenient way of coming to a summary, which is we can think about this as two decades. So here we are now, I, I'm, I, should, I should have put this in reverse order. So 20 years ago, there were 19 continuous GPS on the plate boundary in May 1993. 12 of them were in Southern California, four in Northern California, and three others that I can actually just give their initials, uh, Pie Town, Platteville, and Albert Head. 10 years later, there were 300 continuous GPS, and we were waiting for the PBL proposal to be funded. PBL is part of EarthScope, and it was. And here we are now, and it's time to look ahead. And I hope we can do that with the past in mind. And for humor, I will go back one more decade and illustrate space geodesy with radio waves in 1983, which was a little more cumbersome. Thank you. <laughs>